Hello, welcome to the Area Solutions channel. In this video, I'll be discussing some examples on the degree of freedom for a vibrating system. So we're going to walk through a number of examples for one degree of freedom systems and how to determine the number of degree of freedom down to as much as we can. Commencing with one degree of freedom system, we can have a system model that's shown so that we have a mass we have one spring and we have one damping system and we know that this mass may be undergoing longitudinal vibration along the axis of the system shown and at every point in time we can describe the displacement of the mass by x and of course when the mass is moving the spring is extended if the mass moves downward the spring is extended downwards as well as the damping then when the mass is moving upwards the same way the spring compresses and the damper also compresses and as a result we say that this system is undergoing one degree of freedom motion or the system has one degree of freedom there are several other examples like we can have the same system but this time around rather than um, vertical upward and downward movements we can we can have an horizontal movement of the mass as shown such that the mass could be displaced resulting in a to and fro motion of the mass along the horizontal axis and we can describe the position of the mass and the spring displacement at every point in time by say a linear dimension x then there are several other examples as well we can have a shaft containing a gear that is installed in it and this system can be modeled with a simple structure as shown such that we can say that at every point in time there is to and fro rotation of the gear around the axis of the shaft and we say this system is undergoing torsional vibration and at every point in time we can describe the position of the shaft by an angular movement theta Mind you, there are certain times that even the shaft, as you can see for this case, it's free at the end. There are some times you may have that the shaft at one end is fixed. Then other times you could have that the shaft is fixed at both ends. And that will result in a system as shown. In a system that is shown here. Then we can have another form of system, say a mass attached to a pulley. And the pulley can be made to rotate to and fro undergoing torsional vibration but we will observe that at every point in time that the pulley moves because the mass is attached to it by an inextensible string the mass will be moved will be pushed as well so for this system because the mass is attached to the pulley with an inextensible string we have that if the pulley is made to rotate in the clockwise direction the mass will move upwards and if the pulley is made to rotate in the anticlockwise direction, the mass will move downwards. So if the, if the pulley is rotating to and fro, undergoing torsional vibration, the mass will be moving up and down, undergoing longitudinal vibration. And as a result, we have that even if we can describe the position of the mass by linear dimension x and we can describe the position of the pulley by an angular dimension theta there's a relationship we've learned from our fundamental physics that x is equal to r theta as thus relating the linear dimension to the angular dimension so if you can know any of them if you know the angular displacement of the pulley you can as well tell the angular displacement of the shaft and at us, we, as thus we say that this system is undergoing one degree of freedom then there are several other kinds of one degree of freedom vibrating system we have the transverse vibration of say a beam if we consider this case of a diving board and a man is standing on it depressing it and leaps from it such that the beam is made to go undergo what you call transverse vibration and we, we model it as shown such that the beam is made to undergo what we call transverse vibration and we model it as shown showing the displacement we discover that the system will be made to be moving 
up and down undergoing transverse vibration and at every point in time we can describe the displacement of the beam by an angle theta there are several other examples we can have also a column suspended and it's, and it's displaced from one end and could be modeled using the simple pendulum equation that's one can assume that is oscillating like a pendulum and this is also another example of one degree of freedom system because at every point in time we can describe the displacement of the shaft from its original position by an angular displacement theta a more complicated case of a pendulum we can have the pendulum mo as modeled and we have it attached to a particular spring such that at every point in time if the pendulum is displaced we see that if it's displaced such that it's to move in the anticlockwise direction the, the, the string will be extended in that direction as well the string will be extended in that direction as well we're quickly going to see some examples of two degree of freedom systems for this system we have two masses separated from themselves with a spring and a dashboard dashboard we can have one mass being displaced at one particular point in time without the other mass m2 moving and we can have just m2 moving without m1 moving so because this is the case we say this is a two degree of freedom system there are several other examples we can also have the system arranged such that the displacement we are experiencing is in the horizontal direction but because the two masses are seen in the second figure are separated by a spring from themselves when one is moving it is not likely to affect the movement of the other one and the final case we could even have the mass fixed at two ends but they are separated by springs that are attached to themselves and this is also another example of two degree of freedom system well two degree of freedom systems are not limited to longitudinal vibration alone wherein the system is vibrating along the axis of the system we can also have two degree of freedom in for torsional system like gears attached to a shaft model as shown such that we can have one of the gears rotating through an angle theta one and the other gear rotating through an angle theta two and we can have each of these gears undergoing torsional vibration distinct from themselves taking place at the same time as a result we say this is a two degree of freedom system then we can also have the pulley system such that for this case the mass is attached to the pulley but not with an inextensible string it is possible for the string that is used to attach the mass to the pulley to be stretched and to compress so as a result we can have that the mass is vibrating up and down that's to and fro vibrating longitudinally and we can have that the pulley is undergoing its own torsional vibration that's, rot that's rotating to and fro without affecting the displacement of the mass to, to illustrate this further we know that this pulley can be made to rotate in the clockwise direction for example we have that k1 spring is compressed while k2 spring is extended not affecting the movement of the mass itself and we can also have that the mass is stretched or is pulled downwards if the mass is displaced downward the k2 spring will be extend and if k2 spring is stretched it may not affect the movement of the pulley and as thus we can say that this system can undergo two distinct vibrations either the torsional vibration of the pulley or the longitudinal vibration of the mass and as a result of that this is a two degree of freedom system we can also have our beam that we used as the as we we can also have our beam which we've described earlier but in this case there's a mass attached to it so we can have the beam undergoing what you call transverse vibration that's displaced and is moving to and fro transversely and we can also have our mass displaced such that the mass is moving to and fro in the vertical direction without affecting the movement of the beam and as a result we say this is a two degree of freedom system let's quickly illustrate by saying let's quickly explain this further if 
the mass is displaced, the spring will likely stretch. And the spring can be stretched on displacing the mass without affecting the movement of the beam. Likewise, if the beam is displaced downwards, K1 will be extended and K2 will be compressed. And when K2 is compressed, it may not, it may not affect the movement of mass M2. And as a result, we have distinct movements of the mass as well as the beam. And we can say this is a two degree of freedom system. Then there are degree of freedom. Degree of freedom could be three. That we could have three gears connected to a shaft forming three degree of freedom such that we can have rotation in one of the gears, theta one. We can have another rotation in another gear, theta two, and a final rotation in the last gear, theta three. Mind you, there are different forms this could come. We could have this shaft extended further and fixed at its, at, at its end as well. Then there are other three degree of freedom system like we can see. For this system, we can have high one rotating to and fro, which are affecting all the parts of the system. As thus, K1 may be stretched and compressed to cater for the rotation of I1. If I2 is made to rotate, we would notice that M1 would move as well. If I2 rotates anticlockwisely, M2 will likely be moved upwards making k3 to be stretched but if i2 also but let's note that m1 may not move as i2 is rotated in the anti-clockwise direction the spring k2 may compress and not affect the movement of m1 as a result of that we can say that the movement of m2 and I1, they are together. So that counts as the second degree of freedom. And finally, M1 can be made to move either upwards or downwards. And if M1 is displaced downwards, for example, spring K2 is likely to be stretched. And when K2 is stretched, it is not likely to affect the movement of I2. As a result of that, the movement of M1 can be considered as the third degree of freedom. And as a result, we say this system is a three degree of freedom system. And another example, similar to the case of the three degree of freedom, but let's point out that between M2 and I2, there's another spring K3. So if we want to analyze, count, want to analyze this system to identify the degree of freedom, number of degree of freedom that the system has, we start from I1. When I1 is made to rotate, because there is spring K2 that will either compress or extend, responding to the movement of I1 and not affecting the movement of I2 and other parts of the system, we count that as the first degree of freedom. Then if I2 is made to rotate, we would see that if I2 is rotated either clockwisely or anticlockwise or in the anticlockwise direction, K1 will compress or extend to cater for the movement of I2. The same way K2 will compress or extend to cater for the movement of I2 such that M1 may not be affected. And likewise, K3 will compress or extend to cater for the movement of I2 such that M2 that the mass M2 may not be affected. And as a result, we have the movement of I2 as the second degree of freedom. Then we also have the movement of M2 as a third degree of freedom. If M2 would move, say it, it is displaced upwards, we have an extension of K4 and a compression of K3. And as a result, I2 may not be affected. Another part of the system may not be affected. And finally, if M1, if M1 is displaced, we could have the movement of spring K2 either compressed or extended. And as a result, other parts of the system may not be affected. And because we have four distinct movements, four different parts that can move without affecting other parts of the system, we say that this is a four degree of freedom system. And finally, let's pay attention to this, the analysis of this five degree of freedom system. 
we are going to clearly illustrate the movement of the different parts that makes that constitutes the five degree of freedom for the system. The first part that we will identify is the movement of M1. If M1 is made to move, to vibrate, because there is spring K1 and K2, we are not likely to see movement of any parts, any other parts. So if M1 is displaced to the right, K2 will, be, will compress and K1 will extend. As a result, no other part of the system may be affected. In the same vein, now let's take the movement of pulley I1. If I1 is made to move, that's say it is given a clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation as its displacement, we will note quickly that because spring K2 and spring K5 are attached to it, spring K2 and K5 will extend or contract as the case may be, to cater for the movement of pulley I1 such that the movement of pulley I1 would not affect every other part of the system. So let's take the movement of another part, pulley I2. If we displace pulley I2, we can observe that spring K3 and spring K6 are attached to pulley I2. So if we, for example, displace pulley I2 by giving it a clockwise rotation, spring K3 will compress, while spring K6 will be extended to cater for the clockwise movement of I2. And as, as a result, mass M2 and mass M3 and other parts of the systems may not be affected by the movements of pulley I2. Then another case to consider is the movement of mass M2. If mass M2 is given any form of displacement, either to the right or to the left, horizontally, we can see that spring K3 and spring K4 are attached to M2. So if, for example, we displace M2 to the right of the, if M2 is displaced to the right, spring K4 is likely to be compressed and spring K3 is likely to extend. And this would not affect all other parts of the system. And finally, if we consider the movement of mass M3 vertically, if M3 is given any form of displacement, because of all the springs that are attached to it, we discover that mass M3, once it's displaced, spring K7, spring K5, and spring K6 will either contract or, or extend, as the case may be, to cater for the movement of mass M3, such that every other part of the system may not be affected by the movement of mass M3. And as a result, if we count all the distinct movements in the system, we we'll discover that there are five. That's movement of mass M1, movement of pulley I1, movement of pulley I2, movement of mass M2, and movement of mass M3, all making five degree of freedom system. So if we're going to count the five degree of freedom in the system, we have um, the movement of mass M1, we have movement of pulley I1, we have movement of pulley I3, we have movement of pulley 4, and we have movement of pulley 5. All making five degree of freedom. And finally, let's look at this system. You may want to pause the video and estimate the degree of freedom of this system. And you're going to discover that it has 10 degree of freedom. And this is all about um, degree of freedom. I want to thank you for your time. I sincerely do hope the video was helpful and the degree of freedom of a system that is undergoing vibration is clearly explained and is well understood.